So there's a lot of variety with animation these days. Maybe you like something more kid-friendly or maybe something more adult-appropriate. A weird fun acid trip music video or something in between. Modern animations come a long way from shows made to be long commercials from the 80s to sell bootleg toys to kids. Two shows that seem to have had the biggest influence on these new waves of Western animation are Batman the Animated Series and Avatar The Last Airbender. But what's fascinating to me is how they do this with completely different approaches from their style to their writing and even their intros. With the new Batman series and Avatar Studios coming, this seemed like a great time to talk about them. So I want to compare and contrast them to see why these two are liked by pretty much everyone who watches them and how much they hold up even decades later. Their structures, their worlds, the characters, the heroes, the villains. But just to be clear, I will be focusing on the shows so the tie-in comics and sequel series are out, but will include the tie-in movies like Mask of the Phantasm that use the same characters, animation, and writers working on them. Oh, and a spoiler alert for the two shows that have been out for freaking decades. Let's start with the intros. They are what introduce you to the series after all. The Batman intro has no words or even a title. This was done because the writers thought Batman was so popular it didn't need them. Which was true. Batman had been around for decades and was just coming off the Burton films. The intro is just more or less Batman stopping a couple of robbers accompanied by an orchestra track. It's just a great short visual story that tells you all you need to know about what Batman is and what he does. Avatar's intro, on the other hand, tells you the whole plot. This was needed as the Avatar was a pretty new property with a completely original story and world. Everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. A hundred years passed and my brother and I discovered the new Avatar, an airbender named Aang. The story structure of these worlds are also complete opposites. Batman is an episodic series, meaning most episodes are self-contained stories following where Batman dealing with crime and various villains. But they do use two-part episodes to tell longer stories, some even taking the view of other characters. It takes place in Gotham, a fictional city that is a cesspool of crime which looks like it takes place in the 40s or 50s with tech from the 90s for some reason. It is slightly based on the Burton films and has everything you can want in a fictional city. It has a harbor, chemical plants, abandoned amusement park, train yards, movie studios, blimps for absolutely no reason. You name it, Gotham has it. However, they do move locations a couple of times throughout the show. Its art style was even coined Dark Deco for its noir feel and deco designs. It was created by painting everything black, then adding the visual highlights that gave it that very dark, ominous, gritty feel, just like a noir film. It goes well with the character somber and serious tones. Even when villains don't look very threatening, the shading, angles, and atmosphere does a good job of offsetting it. There were some bumps through it, and as there was a transition to the new Adventures of Batman and Robin, which had an easier animation style that could cross over with the new animated Superman show of the same type. Yeah, most of the hate comes from the new character designs that were hit or miss, the style not being as unique, and too much of the new Robin. Even the older seasons had a few dips in quality, but it's far more impressive that the animation is as consistent as it is when there were over 20 studios working on it. That is an achievement all of its own. Avatar is a bit half episodic and half linear storytelling. There is a beginning and end to each season, but most of the episodes are focused on world building and character development. The overarching story is about Aang, the last Avatar who has been frozen for the last hundred years trying to bring balance to a war-torn land by stopping the Fire Lord. Season 1 has a clear goal of getting to the North Pole to find the waterbending master for Aang and Katara after they broke him free in the South Pole. But most of the episodes are about the people, places, enemies they run into along the way. Just some examples are the time they spent at Kyoshi Island after being caught by the warriors of Kyoshi, and the time they got caught in a fight between the pirates and the Season 1 antagonist Zuko, which they caused by Katara stealing a waterbending scroll. Season 2, the Earth builds upon the first and takes place in the Earth Kingdom, looking for an Earthbending master and seeking help from the Earth King to invade the Fire Nation. The third volume goes to the Fire Nation and deals with the aftermath of the last one's ending while building to the final confrontation. Avatar's world is a bright and colorful fantasy world, complete with magical beasts like Sky Bison and Dragons. It also has some mismatched animals, along with real ones, but the less you think about that, the better. The people and environments are also very distinct from each other. Whether we're talking about the Northern Water Tribe and their Great Ice City, or bossing say in its gigantic walls. You can easily tell where they are or what season they're in just by looking at the buildings and clothes there around them. It has an anime style to it, so characters are given large expressive eyes and unrealistic movements from time to time. It does take a lot of elements from the east in its looks, but it's even more so in its power system that lets you control the elements. As all four styles of bending, earth, fire, air, and water are based on real martial arts. It was all done by two South Korean animation studios. JM Animation for the first two seasons, and Moe, I think is how it's pronounced, Animation, helping out with the third. 
The first season did look a little rough compared to the second and third, but I think that helps as we get to see the animation improve along with the characters. And back to the art style, as they really know how to create gorgeous and scenes and moments throughout the show by using everything to their advantage. Even when they're doing something that's taking color out of it, it is always to elevate the scene. Both have unique worlds that are easy to identify and imaginative, it's hard to say which I like better. Story-wise, the only real problem I have is with their endings. And don't get me wrong on this, Avatar has a solid ending. It's a great happy ending for all, and I loved it until I heard what they had originally planned. This is just my opinion, but I like it a little better because it covers a few more of the loose ends of the show. So basically what they had originally planned was one of the main characters, Katara, ending up with the redeemed Zuko instead of the main character, Aang. Aang would have to let her go to control his super form, the Avatar State, as his duty would be to the world first, which according to the Hermit and his past selves, was what he needed to do to become a full-fledged Avatar. However, in the show he gets hit in the back and it just turns into a DX Machina situation. And the hero gets the girl as always. No sacrifice needed and making the training with the Hermit somewhat pointless. It's not a bad ending by any means, I just like this one a little more as it covers a few more of the plot holes, and again, it's just a nitpick for me. Batman actually got it way worse, while the last episode, Judgment Day, was by no means a bad episode, it wasn't really finale worthy. Apparently the show was cancelled in order to make a new Batman show producers thought would do better with kids that the writers didn't even want to do. Batman had to be a teenager, go to school, have an animal companion, and the worst thing about it is Batman Beyond was actually good, so I can't even be mad about it. And yeah, this is kind of a nitpick as well, seeing as how this wasn't the last time we saw of this particular Batman, who would later appear in other DC animated shows like Justice League Unlimited, so judge that how you will, I'm not really sure. Of course, Batman has one of the most well-known rogue galleries in comics history. Many feel like they came right off the comic book pages like Ra's al Ghul, Catwoman, and Riddler, but they also made brand new ones like Lockdown, Baby Doll, and Hardak, as well as revitalizing old characters like Mr. Freeze. He even comes up against some old school monsters like the Invisible Man, a werewolf, a mummy, and even a Terminator Batman. It has so many memorable villains in so many stories, I can't do them all justice. So I'm going to try to highlight the best ones as well as a few of my personal favorites to see what made them great. Some of the breakout stars seem to be the most tragic villains that were changed by a cruel twist of fate. Like a certain lunatic would say, All it takes is one bad day. Even a character like Baby Doll that looks ridiculous and has a ridiculous plan turns into a sympathetic character. That's me in there. The real me. There I am. But it's not really real, is it? Just made up and pretend like my family and my life and everything else. Why couldn't you just let me make believe? Harvey Dent is one of the few characters we get to know before his transformation into Two-Face in this two-part story named after him. We see him often with Gordon in the GCPD and is even friends with Batman. Not to mention the target of Poison Ivy in her first story, Pretty in Poison. When he starts to suffer from a re-emerging split personality right before his re-election and upcoming marriage, his friends want to help him. And he does start to get help. But as soon as it looks like his troubles are behind him, he gets blackmailed by Rupert Thorne. Under the stress, he snaps into his alternate personality and attacks everyone just as Batman breaks in. There's just one problem. What's that? You're talking to the wrong Harvey. <laughs> In the chaos, there is an explosion, leaving half his body scarred and Batman guilt-ridden for failing to save his friend. Later in the second part, we see him as a well-established crime boss out for Rupert Thorne, while his fiancée Grace and Batman try to save him from himself and bullets. Do you think there's any hope? Where there's love, there's hope, Commissioner. But a little luck wouldn't hurt. Clayface was a self-absorbed actor that was in an accident scarring his face, leading to him taking a so-called miracle drug from Roland Daggett that gives him back his face temporarily. The problem is, the drug is addictive, and Daggett starts calling in favors for him to impersonate people like Bruce Wayne to commit crimes. When he fails at a task given to him, they cut off his supply, so he had to go in and steal more, leading to him getting caught and having thugs pour a large amount of the drug down his throat, turning him into a monster out for revenge. My career! Life! It is gone! And I can never get it back! I'm not an actor anymore! I'm not even... a man! The Clayface episodes also have some of the best animation in the entire show, as Clayface is a shape-shifting blob, and they make full use of it. It also makes a pretty good metaphor for addiction, as he was willing to do anything to get more of the drug. It can't be good for you. It probably ain't good for me. But unless I only want to do horror pictures, 
it ain't bad for me either. Gone. Empty. Only 24 hours. Then it starts all over again. Again, pretty heartbreaking as he was never really an evil guy to begin with. Just maybe a little bit pompous, but that's not really a bad thing. Look at the Megan. Look at what you used to be. You can play those roles again, Hagen. Let me help you find a cure. Mr. Freeze was a poor scientist trying to save his wife with funds from shady backers. When they came in to shut him down for misusing their funds, he actually threatened them, but when they tried to talk him down peacefully and it seemed to be working, they sucker punched him into chemicals that made it to where he needed to be at sub-zero temperatures at all times, thus sending him on his own path of revenge. In my nightmares, I see my Nora behind the glass, begging to me with frozen eyes. How I've longed to see that look frozen on you. It would later be revealed that he would become immortal due to this chemical reaction, later becoming nothing but a head in a jar. Freeze's entire backstory was rewritten for the show, and was so good that it actually became canon in the comics. Freeze's portrayal and the performance was so good, his first episode actually won an Emmy. Bizarrely, he only showed up three times, and I am convinced this second Deep Freeze was the inspiration for Bioshock. It's a rich man in a brown suit with a cane and slip mustache that wants to live forever and building an advanced underwater city for the rich people. I mean, come on. Freeze is by far one of the best villains to walk out of the series, and his last line in Heart of Ice is both in monotone yet saddeningly emotional. I can only beg your forgiveness and pray you hear me somehow. Some place. Some place where a warm hand waits for mine. It's not surprising he actually got to be the main villain of his own movie, Batman Sub-Zero. Speaking of movies, the villain in The Mask of the Phantasm has a chilling design and an actual kill count which Batman gets blamed for, setting up for what was a decent mystery story that I don't even want to ruin by talking about it, I just want to say the movie is underrated. These are the villains that seem to get referenced the most when talking about the series, but others don't follow this trend, and they may not be as tragic, but they have much more relatable experiences. Clock King was a tightwad and strict boss that was always on time until he took the advice of a lawyer and future mayor who was trying to take his business at the time, leading to a series of accidents leading him to be late and losing his livelihood, setting him on a path of revenge against the mayor. It does seem like he lost everything, but it wasn't like the mayor tried to sabotage him. It was actually just a series of weird accidents. I do feel bad for the guy, but I know this response is completely insane. Boy, that escalated quickly. The character of the Riddler was actually cheated by having their intellectual property stolen. To get revenge, he makes a life-size replica of the game that was stolen from him, and sends the man that stole it in to die, leaving Batman and Robin to rescue him by solving the game. In the first couple outings, he actually gets away, making him one of the few villains to get one over on Batman's multiple times. How much is a good night's sleep worth? Now there's a riddle for you. Another legacy villain, Penguin, tries to go straight for real and even gets a girlfriend in the process. However, she is more or less trying to use him as a publicity stunt. However, his genuine affection from her starts to win her over. Sadly, we never get to know if this could have been a real thing or gone anywhere, as he finds out she is just using him, with no one willing to give him a chance, including Batman, and the only person he did trust to betray him, he soon goes back to his villainous ways. The episode is called Birds of a Feather and is definitely one of the best Penguin stories out there, as Penguin actually does try to make a genuine effort to change his life around, but nobody really seems to want to give him the chance. And that's kind of what he really hits this one so hard. Please, Oswald, if it's money you want, I can get you more! Shut up! All I wanted from you, dearie, was a little friendship. That would have cost you nothing. Not all try to tug at your heartstrings, though, and just look for sheer entertainment value. We have a fake cultist, thrill-seeking billionaires, a scarecrow, strange doctors, immortal eco-terrorist, and a man-bat not to be confused with Batman. And characters like Dagger, the Sewer King, Thorn, are just plain evil throughout. Like I said, I can't do them all justice, but with that said, we have to talk about Batman's most infamous villain, the clown prince of crime, Joker. Voiced by the same voice actor that voices Skips from the regular show, Hobgoblin from the 90s Spider-Man cartoon, and Luke Skywalker in A New Hope. He perfectly captures the manic town and energy of a comic book psychopath. He can go from calm to violently angry in a heartbeat, and always has a dark sense of humor. Boy, did you get a wrong number. Leave your message at the sound of the shriek. No, please, don't! Ah! His actions are also very erratic, episode to episode. At one moment, he's poisoning Gotham with Joker gas, the next he's riding a Christmas tree rocket singing Batman Smells. 
One of the best episodes, Laughing Fish, has him try to patent a Joker fish, as well as the products he wants to sell, and even made a jingle for them. Of course, when this doesn't happen, he threatens to kill the patent office employee, and the whole episode is a cat and mouse game between him and Batman, trying to stop him before he strikes. Eventually, Joker catches Bullock and Batman and tries to feed them to a shark, which Batman rides to escape, eventually leading to a climactic fight between the two. Nemesis is on top of the building. Joker, in an attempt to escape, jumps off the building into an ocean where the previously mentioned shark was let loose, and waiting for him. It looks like the Clown Prince is gone for good, but Batman knows better than to assume that. And actually, that's actually something of a running joke throughout the entire DCAU. That Joker just keeps dying and coming back with absolutely no reason whatsoever. He's been fed to sharks, killed by the Phantom, thrown in down a chimney stack, blown up in Superman the Animated Series, and shot dead and electrocuted. But he always keeps coming back, even in Batman Beyond. He was the perfect foil to Kevin Conroy's story Batman, and in fact, whenever they do a reboot or game or movie, they try to get them to reprise the roles. And it's not hard to see why. Great Scott! Actually, I'm Irish. Batman, no doubt, has some of the best villains of all time, and this only added to that notion. The Avatar villains are very different, as what makes the Avatar villains great is how they are structured. They have an almost perfect build-up to the final boss, Fire Lord Ozai, who was actually not seen fully until halfway through the last season. Really, he is a pretty generic take-over-the-world villain, but we get a better sense of how much of a monster he is through his children, who played the main antagonist for the first two seasons. Also, he is voiced by the same person as Quarry from Generator Rex, Luke Skywalker in Last Jedi, and Joker from Oh Hey Look, Small World. Zuko is the main antagonist for most of the first season. He's angry and temperamental with the sole goal of capturing the Avatar to regain his honor and his father's approval. We learned the reasons for all this in the episode The Storm. When Zuko was invited to a war meeting, he spoke out against a general's plan to sacrifice young soldiers. After he was challenged to a duel called an Agni Kai with who he thought was going to be the general, it actually turned out to be his own father who took this outburst as looking bad on him, and when he refused to fight his own dad, he burned his face and banished him for showing weakness. Then his father told him the only way back was to capture the Avatar, which at that point no one had seen for over a hundred years. So he basically sent him on what was an impossible task to never see him again. That's how screwed up this man is. Azula is Zuko's younger sister and the favorite of their father. She is introduced in the second season, and right away she establishes she is more dangerous than Zuko. In the first episode we see her, she is attempting to capture her brother and uncle. First, by straight up lying to their faces, which almost works, if one idiot hadn't screwed it up. Raise the anchors! We're taking the prisoners home! You know that guy is definitely dead after this. She easily overpowered Zuko in a 1v1 fight, and would have killed him if not for Uncle Iroh. She only gets more imposing from that point on. Later, joined by Mei and Tai Li, two non-benders with contradicting personalities that can easily take on groups of trained soldiers. There's really a tense scene between her and her quote-unquote friend Tai Li when she attempts to recruit her in her pursuit of Team Avatar. At first, she's happy to see Azula, but Tai Li becomes uneasy when she tells Azula that she's happy with her life at the circus and is relieved when she says she accepts her decision. But suddenly she's alarmed again when Azula says she can't wait to see her perform that night. It tells you a lot about Azula's relationships and how people that know her view her. And this is all done BEFORE we see her tell the Ringmaster to set the place on fire and release all the animals to convince Tylee to join her. Are you the way that you are? Really, she is a true monster and everything about her is intimidating. To her cold, perfectionist mentality, calm attitude while in danger, her blue fire bending, which is meant to symbolize her cold-blooded nature. Again, this is the favorite child of their father. Moving on to the Fire Lord Ozai, he is again a very typical evil overlord, but we get something we don't normally see from this type, and that's how they affect their families. He's extremely distant and transactional with both his kids. Even after Zuko had accomplished two impossible tasks, he shows practically no emotion, and he does the same to Azula, his favorite. As he becomes the new Phoenix King, God of the Earth, as he says, Azula begs him to take her with him. He doesn't want to share this glory with anybody, though, so he just decides to make her Fire Lord to shut her up. There is no hugging, there is no craziness, he just wants her out of his way. This man is a straight-up narcissist through and through, and that's what makes him fun to hate. I have all the power in the world! Avatar also has what I'm going to call sub-bosses for each season that mirror the main boss in some way. In the first season, we had Admiral Zhao. He's hot-headed like Zuko and follows his goal with a serious obsession. Unlike Zuko, he does so for power and not honor, or have anyone to guide him away from his worst impulses like Uncle Iroh. He is completely consumed by his anger and pride by the end, though. 
In the first episode we see Zhao Wen, he ends up challenging Zuko to a duel, and after losing, he tries to attack him while his back is turned. In the final episode we see him in, he again duels Zuko, but when we see him about to meet his end, Zuko lends out a hand to save him. Zhao refuses to take it and dies with his pride, showing that while Zhao is lost, Zuko still has hope for redemption. He may also be one of the most underrated villains, as his actions reach all the way to the last season. Zhao was the one who found and burned the Fire Nation section of the Spirit Library, and no doubt warned the Fire Nation of the Day of the Black Sun, which is the day they would be at their weakest and the Team Avatar plan to invade the Fire Nation. Long Fang becomes the main obstacle once Team Avatar arrives in the Earth Kingdom capital of Ba Sing Se. Long Fang had taken over the city and hid the war from the Earth King, the man in control of the nation, in order to stay in power. He wasn't a physical threat, but instead used manipulation and hides behind his position. He even kidnaps Aang Sky Bising Appa in order to keep the team from acting against him and controlling all access to the Earth Kingdom to keep him unaware just so he can stay in control of the city. In the city itself, he maintains complete control by using secret police, aka the Dai Li. He presents the team with a much different threat as the heroes can't outright go against him, constantly putting them one step behind their goal. Fortunately, it comes crashing down after Zuko frees Appa, thus letting the team go and convince the Earth King that Lao Fang has been manipulating him, which lands Lao Fang in prison. Looks like Long Fang is long gone! <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been waiting to use that one. Despite this, he still controls the Dai Li and later teams up with Azula to destroy the Earth Kingdom. Later, when the time comes for them to betray one another to see who gets to control the city, Azula makes him bend the knee, showing that he was nothing but a paper tiger without his position compared to Azula, who is vicious despite her position. They don't know which one of us is going to be sitting on that throne, and which one is going to be bowing down. But I know, and you know. You've beaten me at my own game. Don't flatter yourself. You were never even a player. In a later season, we are introduced to a character later named Combustion Man, who is a bounty hunter Zuko hired to finish the Avatar before anyone realized he survived the season 2. The guy is big, silent, and efficient, even setting a trap by catching both Toph and Katara while they tried to pull a scam and bond in the process, not knowing he was onto them and planned to use them as bait to lure in the others. He also has a strange form of firebending, where he seems to just point and shoot a lethal explosion shot from his forehead. Along with that, he has two metal limbs that really sell the relentless machine look they were going for. There are also some truly unique spirit monsters, but I wouldn't really call them antagonists or villains. Ko the Face Stealer is a truly terrifying being that would have stolen Aang's face. However, he isn't really trying to stop the hero and technically does help the Avatar. There is also the Owl Spirit in charge of the library who attacked them, but Team Avatar was actually stealing from him, so not really evil or ought to stop them either. And they really didn't even need to steal from him either, they could have just wrote that down, I don't know why they didn't do that. There are a couple of standout villains like Hama from the Puppet Master in the third season, and Jet from the first season episode of the same name. They seem to hit the right balance of sympathetic, charming, and insane that makes them stand out in a single episode. Both shows have great villains for sure, but the ones that seem to stand out in avatars or the ones that help to set up or build up each other, such as Zuko, Zhao, Zula, Fang, Ozai, etc. While Batman's villains seem to be driven more by personality, like Mr. Freeze, Clayface, and Joker. Not to say there aren't outliers like Hama or Two-Face, but this is what they're best known for. I personally like Batman villains a little more, as even with one-off like Baby Doll, Count Vertigo, and the Invisible Man Lloyd Ventress, you can still sympathize, hate, or both. Even when their villains are doing something as mundane as playing poker or stealing the Batmobile, they are entertaining. Half of me wants to strangle you. And what does the other half want? To hit you with a truck. We used to date. Ah. Meanwhile, the majority of Avatar villains just seem to be there for the heroes to beat physically, like the rough rhinos who look great but aren't really that much of a threat, or the warden that sounds like George Takei. That was the captain you just threw overboard, so... Then wake up someone I haven't thrown overboard and search the rig. There's something going on here and I don't like it. They are by no means bad, and they do have good action, but character-wise, they're just average villains. Batman pushes ahead with quality and quality for me, but that's just my opinion. That last statement stricken from the record, please. Record? Is someone supposed to be writing this down? What's the story without people to fill it? Batman's characters take more of a supporting role, like Alfred and Commissioner Gordon, but it does take time to flesh them out, as well as take entire episodes and follow other characters. Episodes like POV, The Man Who Killed Batman, The Grey Ghost, Harley Quinnade, and A Bullet for Bullock, just to name a few. Avatar side characters go a little further than just being supports for their lead and have their own arcs. 
Suki, Saga, Iroh, and Zuko all play pivotal roles at key moments throughout the story. Iroh retaking Bossing Say, Katara guarding Aang while he was in the spirit realm, and the list goes on. But that's just the main cast, as there are many Avatar characters that leave a pretty decent impression, even in one episode. So let's get to it, but there are two characters that I'm going to compare side by side, and that's Robin and Kintara, for how similar their episodes of the Southern Raiders and Robin's Reckoning were. One of the best arcs in Avatar probably comes from Zuko, starting out as an antagonist for most of Season 1, but even then it is shown to be a much more layered character. As we learn more about his backstory in the Season 1 episode The Storm, and see him at his lowest in Season 2's episode Zuko Alone after he had split from his uncle Iroh. After Zuko and Iroh reunite, they seem to have a run of good fortune in Bossing Se. In it, they start jobs as tea merchants, eventually leading to Iroh getting his own tea shop, and Zuko seems to be leaving his toxic drive to appease his father at all costs when he decides to free Appa from Long Fang, leading to one of his most important actions. After Azula arrives in Bossing Se, posing as a Kyoshi warrior, she learns Zuko and Iroh are in the city. She again attempts to capture them, only succeeding in catching Zuko, whose pride leads him to disaster again as he tries to take on Azula alone after being goaded on by he was thrown into a cavern with Katara, who seemed to be connecting on their shared loss as Aang and Iroh team up to rescue them. In the middle of the breakout, Zuko corners Azula with Aang and Katara, but Azula attempts to persuade him with the one thing he's wanted all along, redemption. It's not too late for you, Zuko. You can still redeem yourself. The kind of redemption she offers is not for you. Why don't you let him decide, uncle? At the end of this day, you will have your honor back. You will have father's love. You will have everything you want. The moment is tense, as you're not really sure of what Zuko will do. Unfortunately, he sides with his sister, leading to one of the most heartbreaking moments of Aang falling after being struck in the back by Azula, and Iroh sacrificing himself for Aang and Katara. Zuko arresting the man who always looked out for him for the man that scarred his face and basically exiled him is a gut punch, but one of the best character moments and scenes in the entire show. And it's definitely one of the most defining moments in the show, as it shapes everything in the next season. But as someone who watched it as a kid, it was one of the most shocking scenes I ever saw. I was certain after everything Zuko would join the good guys at that moment, and that there was no way that he could redeem himself afterwards. They pulled it off though. After getting his title and returning home, he still feels angry and empty inside, even though life starts to look pretty good for him at first. After he does some soul searching, even going to learn his family's secret history with the previous Avatar Roku, he finally realizes his father only seeks power and will destroy his own nation. We've created an era of fear in the world, and if we don't want the world to destroy itself, we need to replace it with an era of peace and kindness. He seeks out Aang so that he may teach him firebending and help him fulfill his own destiny. However, it would take a lot of convincing, as the team, rightly so, distrusts him. And it mostly takes a personal journey with every member of the team avatar he used to hunt down. Such as the episode of Boiling Rock, where Zuko has to help Sokka break into then out of the best Fire Nation prison for his dad and accidentally his girlfriend. He eventually faces off with his sister one last time in the finale for control of the Fire Nation in a 1v1 duel. Let's settle this. Just you and me, brother. The showdown that was always meant to be. Agony Kai! You're on. One of my favorite arcs actually follows Sokka, as he starts out somewhat as a comic relief. You know, he's a loudmouth who overestimates his combat abilities constantly, leading him to do some pretty foolish things like take on an entire warship of soldiers instead of getting everyone to safety, or talking smack to a group of warriors who just captured him because they're girls. Humility can do a lot for a character though, and when Sokka's not trying to act like he's the strongest warrior on Earth, and instead just doing by what his gut tells him is right, he actually achieves more of his goals. As we see, Sokka does actually have good skills and intuition, like in the episode Jet, where he learns Jet is willing to attack an elderly man and kill innocent people with a flood, this puts them at odds, leading to Sokka being captured. However, Sokka escapes on his own, and instead of going to fight Jet like he did Zuko, he goes and warns the town, thus saving them from the flood. He also learns to put more faith in his brain power, which even lands him the title of the team's idea guy, as his ideas are often the team's reason for success, like stopping an entire Fire Nation army that was attacking one of the air temples in Season 1, by using the solution he came up with for their flammable gas problem. And actually, with that one episode alone, Sokka might have the highest death count in the entire show. I also like to contrast Sokka to the moron in Season 1 Han, who in many ways was what Sokka wanted to be at the beginning, a famous warrior and somewhat of a chauvinist. He's also pretty shallow, as he admits he's only marrying the girl who Sokka is currently crushing on simply for her beauty and perks. Of course, he makes the same mistake Sokka did at the beginning by shouting and running straight at a stronger opponent, this time Zhao, but Han ain't getting a redemption arc. Joy. Prepare to meet your fate! In the second season, he learns to play to his strengths, using his ingenuity to solve very complex problems. 
like how he figured out how to stop the massive drill breaking into Ba Sing Se, not cutting through it as a whole, but taking it down inch by inch, then landing one clear decisive blow to end the entire machine. He also has one of my favorite episodes called Sokka's Master, where he seeks to improve himself as a warrior by seeking the Fire Nation's greatest swordmaster, Peen Dao, to train him. The Master expects Sokka to brag about his accomplishments and feats, but instead he approaches him with humility, saying, I know one thing for sure. I have a lot to learn. You're not doing a very good job of selling yourself. I know. Your butler told me that when I met you, I would have to prove my worth. But the truth is, I don't know if I am worthy. Hmm. Showing how far he's improved since season one. A big, strong man like you? We wouldn't stand a chance. True, but don't feel bad. After all, I'm the best warrior in my village. This wins him over, and they have a great student-teacher relationship, where P. Down works more with Sokka's, um eccentricities, even cheering him on in the middle of an old-school sword duel with him after Sokka reveals he is from the Water Tribe and that he has technically been lying to him the whole time. Then there is Toph, who is just the GOAT. She is small, blind, is every bit as good as she thinks she is, and can body a room full of girl men like they were nothing. No need for an arc when you nail it from the start. Okay, she does have something of an adjustment period where she has to learn to help others and let them help her in return. With some help from Iroh in the form of some wise words, she also has something of a great bromance with Katara. <laughs> The one subplot she is involved in just leads to her discovering how to metal bend and leaving two men to die in a metal box. I am the greatest earthbender in the world! Don't you two dunderheads ever forget it! And this is just the main team. There are tons of interesting side characters from the Nutty King Boomy, who was Aang's friend from a hundred freaking years ago, Tao and his inventive father who took residence up in the Air Nomad Temple, Haru, Suki, leader of the Kyoshi Warriors, the bounty hunter with the tracking monster, even the Cabbage Guy. It's kind of like the Batman's villains, where there's so many of them, I can't do them all justice. And I could have done an entire video on Iroh alone, and I know people have. Even Appa, Aang's Sky Bison, gets one of the best episodes in Appa's Lost Days, where it shows how he wound up being captured by Law Feng, as well as how he met Aang. And since he an animal, it's mostly done through visual storytelling. I just want to say good effort out there today, Team Avatar. Uh, like I said, most of Batman's characters don't have arcs like an Avatar, but are there mainly to support Batman. The one we see the most of would of course be Alfred, Bruce Wayne's loyal butler and father figure, who is always around to help him with jaded wisdom or even pull off a rescue when needed to. I know your father would be proud of you, because I'm so proud of you. Now come on, it's time for chicken soup and a good night's sleep. Then there's the GCP officers like Commissioner Gordon and Harvey Bullock. They get a surprising amount of characterization, such as their faith in each other, evident in episodes like Vendetta, where Bullock seems to be framed for a crime, and due to a suspicious past and behavior, even Batman suspects him as guilty, with only the Commissioner to go to bat for him, much like how he did in POV. Look, Harvey Bullock is hard to work with, even harder to like. But he's a good cop, Batman. He's clean. In Bullock for Bullock, Bullock actually asked Batman to help find who's put a hit out on him, and the two end up taking down an entire drug operation who weren't ever out to get him. Guess who's on top of my naughty list? No, Bullock! Relax, cowlhead. This dirtbag don't get off that easy. Another GCPD officer, Renee Matoya, was introduced in the episode P.O.B., where she, Bullock, and a rookie describe their last operation to their superiors, where Batman intervened to help save them. She was an original character for the show that would later go on to become a regular character in the comics, even becoming the superhero The Question. Officer Montoya earned this collar. Then we have Gordon's daughter Barbara, who would later become Batgirl. But even before that, she proved to be a capable detective by playing key roles in Heart of Steel, exposing and rescuing her father from the android duplicates, she officially became Batgirl in Shadow of the Bat when her father is framed for taking bribes. Let's see what Batgirl can do. Gorn would also become a figure piece in many episodes. He might not get as much focus as the others, but he's definitely still one of the most important. Maybe if I'd been younger, could have been like you. Always wanted to be a hero. You are a hero, Jim. Then there's Catwoman, Batman's on-again, off-again love slash partner slash criminal, who gets some of her own episodes like Cat in the Claw, where the two have to stop a group of eco-terrorism from spreading deadly gas, and Tiger Tire, where she gets turned into a literal Catwoman. Was this part of your plan? It is now. 
Harley Quinn is a fan favorite that wasn't meant to last long, but became the most popular character to come out of this entire series. Originally intended to just be the Joker's sidekick slash girlfriend, made for the show, and only supposed to appear in a couple of episodes. She grew in terms of popularity, and would later get her own comic, movie, and animated TV show. And it all started on this show. Two of Harley's best episodes were Harley Quinnade and Harley and Ivy, which seemed to be the base of what we would later see from her. In Harley Quinnade, Bass asked her assistance in tracking down the Joker, who got in his hands on an atomic bomb, which leads to a musical number I tried to be a loop when you pushed me off the roof a huge brawl in a fake casino <laughs> couple of betrayals. You know, Bats, I got a crazy idea. Mr. J may not be the guy for me after all. <laughs> the whole thing ends with Harley stopping the Joker and trying to kill him, which somehow leads to them getting back together and continuing this toxic time bomb of a relationship. What was she before she went bonkers? A clinical psychiatrist. Figures. In Harley and Ivy, after a failed heist, a frustrated Joker boots Harley Quinn from his gang, and in an attempt to prove her worth to the Joker, Harley goes on a solo crime spree. This eventually leads to her crossing paths with Poison Ivy, and the two form as something of a partnership. The success of Harley and Ivy as the new queens of crime doesn't go unnoticed by the Joker or Batman, both of whom set out to stop the amazing duo for their own personal reasons. They almost kill Batman, Joker almost kills them, and they both are stopped by Montoya while Batman stops Joker. They actually made such a good team, they would be confirmed to be in a true romantic relationship in canon in the comics. Nowadays, Harley has her own TVMA rated show. I would definitely recommend it, but just to be warned, it does earn that TVMA rating. For you yet. One of my personal favorite episodes is The Great Ghost. In the episode, there's someone going by the Mad Bomber, who, well, is bombing places. But Batman realizes he's following the plot of an old TV show he watched as a kid called The Great Ghost. To find out how that ends, Batman has to track down the old actor who's been struggling after being typecast as the goofy old superhero. They eventually team up to stop the villain after Batman reveals how much of an inspiration he was to him as a kid. The Great Ghost was my hero, so it wasn't all for nothing. The whole story was a love letter to the 60s Batman Adam West, who actually voiced the Great Ghost in this episode. Bruce Timm himself even voiced the villain of the episode. The story behind it is actually the story of the show, as Bruce Timm actually got into Batman because he was a fan of the 60s show. He even hired a lot of the same actors to do the voices in this show. The 60s show does get a fair share of ridicule for honestly good reasons. At the same time, without it, we wouldn't have this great show. And that reminds me, it's not just the greats that inspire great works, it's whatever someone enjoys that inspires them. Maybe in 20 years, someone will make the best Teen Titans show because they were a fan of Go. It could happen. You know, as a kid, I used to watch it with my father. The Great Ghost was my hero. Really? And he still is. A few other fan favorites are The Men Who Killed Batman, which follows a low-level thug that apparently kills Batman, Zatanna, where he teams up with Zatanna, and the episode where Batman teams up with Etrigan, the demon, to stop a furry and a demonic child. There are two characters I wanted to single out and compare side by side, and that was Katara and Robin. I know they both have many different character arcs, such as Katara's fight for equality and Robin's strained parental relationship, leading him to become Nightwing, but what they mean to the other characters and the story are very similar. As well as their best standalone episodes, for me, Robin's Reckoning and the Southern Raiders, happen to be very, very, very similar. Both are very much the humanizing element in their show. Katara is the one to always put others above herself and seek to stop any injustice like we see in the episode in prison. Or again, that fight for equality in the Northern Water Tribe. Meanwhile, Robin is the foil for Batman to help humanize him. He's relaxed, has an outside social life, is usually the one to have a heart-to-heart -heart moment with bats like in the episode I Am The Knight. And that's why I think these episodes are some of the best as it puts them in their darkest situation and brings out a side we don't expect to see from them. Both the episodes involve them tracking down their parents' murderers. This is about getting closure and justice. I don't think so. I think it's about getting revenge. Fine, maybe it is. Maybe that's what I need. Maybe that's what he deserves. Stuff your advice, Batman. You and your stone cold heart. You don't know how I feel. How could you? Both episodes go back and forth on their search for the killers and flashbacks of their incidents. And like I said, most of the drama in these episodes come from seeing these normally lighthearted characters going full Frank Castle. Robin is visibly going off on pretty much everyone, including Batman, and even flips the script by coming to his rescue in this episode. 
Katara is even more disturbing as she stays mostly silent on their initial takedown of the leader of the raiders and the horrifying method they use to subdue him. When they both come face to face with the killers, their performances are on point. Of course, they don't actually kill them. These were still marketed as kids shows, but this is still some of the best acting in the entire series. Even if you can probably guess how both episodes end, the acting and visuals completely make up for it. As every time I watch the episode, I almost believe that they're actually going to kill them. The big differences between the episodes is how the other characters act. Batman tries to hide the truth from Robin and take down Zuko on his own to protect him, while Zuko, not that one, goes all in with Katara as he's attempting to make amends for his previous betrayal. All the characters are great, but I personally like Avatars a little bit better as they get more screen time and have their own arcs. Batman's characters aren't bad by any means, but again, Avatar just kinda outpaces them the same way Batman did with the villains, in both quality and quantity for me. I just want to say, good effort out there today, Team Avatar. Enough with the Team Avatar stuff. No matter how many times you say it, it's not gonna catch on. Okay, now let's get to the main heroes, Batman and Aang. On the outside, they are exact opposites. Batman is a stoic adult with no powers who dedicated his life to fighting crime after a cruel twist of fate, and Aang is an emotional child that was born the strongest being destined to bring balance to the world. However, they do share a number of themes like guilt, responsibility, and fear, but their outlooks and reactions are completely different. Along with the messages of the shows, Batman being more about perseverance and avatar balance. Let's start at the beginning. By this point, everyone knows the origins of Batman. While walking home from a movie, the Wayne family decided to take a shortcut through an alley where they are gunned down right in front of Bruce. From that point on, he decided to dedicate his life to fighting crime for justice, revenge, and so no one would suffer like him. However, the guilt of that incident resulted in him putting most, if not all, of responsibility on his shoulders. When Batman faces off with the Scarecrow, we learn his greatest fear is dishonoring his parents' legacy, and after he fails to save his friend Harvey Dent, he blames himself in a dark nightmare dream sequence that again leads back to his parents, all leading to some of the most chilling lines in the series. Why couldn't you save us, son? <gasps> Bats literally blames himself for these tragedies by not being good enough to stop them. In Mask of the Phantasm, Bruce actually goes to his parents' grave and begs forgiveness for feeling happy. But I didn't see this coming. I didn't count on being happy. Please, tell me that it's okay. That is just a dark and heartbreaking moment to watch, and this is what leads to his insane drive to always try to save everyone. In this way, Batman is a tragic cautionary tale just like his villains who never dealt properly with their past, but he still marches on making silver linings in a bleak world, even if he can't see the light at the end. In the episode of Poor Man Crime Alley, Batman is trying to meet a longtime friendly friend, Leslie Tompkins, only to discover she has gone missing and sets out to find her. Leslie has actually been kidnapped by Roland Daggett for getting in his way to destroy Crime Alley to expand his own business by running the residents out. The entire time, Batman is being sidetracked by random crimes that have nothing to do with Daggett. He is constantly on a race with a clock to save his friend, while stopping these crooks and disasters as soon as they start. Seemingly pulling it all off, but there isn't much of a happy ending though. Daggett never really faces jail time for this, and the high crime rate we see was the pitch Daggett used to try to convince the city to let him bulldoze over the residents, saying it is a lost cause. After Leslie is rescued, they both lament how bad the neighborhood has gotten, but saying, This used to be a beautiful street. Good people lived here once. Good people still live in Crime Alley. The last scene is Leslie holding Batman, saying his actual name before it pans out to an old photo of her doing the same to the child Bruce. It is bizarrely those acts of kind selflessness in the face of oblique reality that are the true melancholy beauty of the show. It could be fairly easy for Batmans or Tompkins to give up on this neighborhood, but they don't. Batman, Leslie, and the rest of the heroes persist onwards as the only way for evil to truly win is when good people do nothing. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I Batman. Aang starts out in a completely different circumstance as he was destined to save the world, but finds himself in an awfully familiar place. It all started when Aang learned he was going to be the Avatar. Normally, the Air Nomads would have waited till Aang was 16, but told him early at 12 due to them seeing signs of an imminent war coming. Soon, his friends started treating him differently, not letting him join in games as it wouldn't be fair to have the Avatar on either team. Things escalate as Aang eavesdrops on a conversation with the other monks and learns that they intend to send him away from his guardian Gyatso to receive better training for the upcoming war. After learning this news, Aang runs away not knowing what to do or handle this new massive responsibility. He gets caught in a storm falling into the ocean to do a Captain America for 100 years until he is freed by Katara and Sokka at the start of the series. 
Even after being told the world has been at war for 100 years, Aang is somewhat in denial about it for a while. As we see in the third episode, The Southern Air Temple, where Aang is excited to show his friends his old home, Katara tries to temper his expectations, though, about what they will find, bringing up that no one has seen airbenders for nearly a century, but he refuses to believe they're gone. Just because no one has seen an airbender doesn't mean the Fire Nation killed them all. They probably escaped. I think we all know where this is going, so let's just skip to the end. When they arrive, the temple is indeed abandoned. Aang is disheartened, but Sokka and Katara try to distract him with a game. They also continue to hide evidence that the firebender is breaching the temple, but he eventually finds out after seeing the skeleton of Gyatsu surrounded by Fire Nation. Firebenders? They were here? Gyatso. Ugh. Aang lashes out in anger, turning into the Avatar state for the first time and causes havoc all around. And this wouldn't be the last time either. Aang really starts to struggle from the guilt of leaving, especially after he comes into contact with the Fisherman in an episode of The Storm, who directly blames him for not stopping the Fire Nation back then. As well as accepting things like change when the inventors take residence in one of the old air temples, destroying most of the history with their renovations. And this is pretty much Aang's arc through this show, as he comes to accept his powers as part of him and duty as Avatar, as well as dealing with the guilt for not fighting hundreds of years ago and coming to terms with the world with help from his newfound family. Despite all that, Aang never really loses his wide-eyed optimism. He always sees the good in everyone, even trying to connect with Zuko in the first season after they rescue each other, he starts telling him of his old friend in the Fire Nation, then asks, If we knew each other back then, do you think we could have been friends too? Zuko of course attacks him, but before, there is just this moment of calm reflection of what he said. It's one of my most favorite scenes in the entire show, and is also one of the first to forgive Zuko after his realization. Violence wasn't the answer. It never is. I do believe age is a big difference between these heroes, as Aang is a good-natured kid, but still a kid subject to all the fears and angers about responsibility. But he still has time to grow and learn from his actions. When Aang first learns to use firebending, he acts recklessly, ignoring what his teacher was warning him about, the danger of using power when you don't know responsibility. That is until he hurts Katara by literally playing with fire. It was an accident! I was... Uh, Katara, I'm so... Uh, I told you we shouldn't mess around with this! Look what you did! You burned my sister! When Katara and Sokka meet up with a member of their tribe, Bada, who is with their father, Aang initially hides a letter telling them where their father is because he's scared of them leaving him to join their father. It sounds terrible, but remember, Aang is a kid who has already once lost a number of his closest friends. And he does eventually tell them. However, it does cause them to split for an episode. These are important because it shows that Aang is still very much a kid that has to learn, and he does. Heck, you could even say Aang's arc is a coming-of-age story where all of a sudden you have responsibility and duties that you fail at before you get the hang of them. Not just bringing balance to the world, but himself, and by the end, he does accomplish both. Meanwhile, Batman is an adult who has already come to terms with the path he chose. He doesn't have the same straightforward growth like Aang has, and is very much a flat character. We get the entertainment from how he fights against the villains. Nobody panic! Although I don't want you getting the wrong idea, episodes like Never Too Late, The Forgotten, I Am the Night, Appointment in Crime Alley, and His Silicon Soul are just a few that show how much Batman truly cares about the people of Gotham and the innocent. In Appointment in Crime Alley, the villain Daggett never really faced justice, but Batman never really regretted his actions, instead focusing on the people that needed saving. In The Forgotten, he goes undercover to discover why the homeless of Gotham have been disappearing, which most don't seem to care about. Batman loses his memory in the process, leading to another dream sequence to remind him why he's there and showing just how deeply he does care. At one point in I Am The Night, he reveals that if a villain eventually does him in, he would have no regrets. Sooner or later I'll go down. It might be the Joker, or Two-Face, or just some punk who gets lucky. My decision, no regrets. The thing that is making him contemplate leaving the cape behind was that he wasn't good enough for it, since Gordon was hurt because he was late to the sting, as well as Batman becoming something of a novelty, better for the tourist attraction than the crime. Again, putting the blame on himself, needing Robin to help him out of the spiral. He also got a reminder to keep going by Gordon, and by the kid he saved, which was the reason he was late to the sting. The episode ends with the kid telling Batman how he is going to set his life back on the right track, and renews Batman's sense of purpose. A lot of the show's writing reflects their key differences in age as well. Even when Batman is going out of his way to try to change minds without punches like in the episode Never Too Late, where Batman attempts to reform a mob boss, Batman is always in control of the situation, leading the story, and reserved in his emotions. 
where Aang is reactive in most of the story and overly emotional. Like in the episode Tales of Ba Sing Se, where he tries to help transport a literal zoo with absolutely no plan just to help the animals. It goes... Don't worry, I'm great with animals. <laughs> Forget it. But he does eventually accomplish that task. My like and respect for both heroes are about even, but for completely different reasons. Batman is the classic, unfaltering hero who always rises above his own obstacles, and is always calm and in charge of the situation even when it seems like he isn't. Batman isn't made of stone though, he is just more reserved and pessimistic. This makes sense, as Bat's world is presented as a dark place where crime rules, but Batman stays despite that or because of this. Even though Batman can't see a light at the end of the tunnel, he will never stop because he does care about the people. Even the Terminator Batman, who was built to be so much like him in his Silicon Soul, actually has a breakdown when he believes he may have killed the actual Batman. Uh, no! I've taken a life. My city. My people. What have I done? He was even fighting his programming before this, and this act pushed him to destroy Hardak once and for all, leaving Bats to wonder if the machine had a soul. That's just how altruistic Batman is. His own robot duplicate defied his programming because he was built to be too much like Batman. Aang I respect more for what he doesn't do, as it could have been so easy for Aang to just become jaded hero like Batman. But Aang did the one thing Batman couldn't, and that's be happy. In the third season, the first episode of The Awakening, we do see him at his lowest, picking up weeks after the finale of season two, where the Earth Kingdom fell. Aang is putting all the blame for this loss on himself, telling himself that he failed when his friends tell him everybody thinks he's dead. The team tries to convince him that this is an advantage. Aang, however, not wanting to put his friends in harm's way, he leaves while still injured, meaning to fight the Fire Lord on his own to redeem his failure. Which is a very Batman thing to do, to be honest. Heck, at one point, Batman even fights and defeats Penguin while he was completely blind. But back to Aang, as he doesn't get too far before getting caught in a storm and falling into the ocean. When all seems lost, Aang gets some words of encouragement from his past life, Roku, and the Moon Spirit, before reuniting with his friends, who tell him no matter what, they will be there to help him every step of the way. The episode right after, called The Headband, is a much more lighthearted, footloose-like episode, where the gang throw a dance party for some Fire Nation students. It's small in the grand scheme of the story, but it is important because it's Aang at his best. Aang is a pacifist who wants people to be happy, and more importantly, he enjoys it, always trying to find the best in everyone and make people happy. Both episodes are great and gets to the core message of what Avatar is. Balance. Not just balancing the world with one fight, but yourself by opening up to people that want to help you and vice versa. The best lessons these shows ever taught me is that you don't do good because you should or have to, but because you can do good. No matter how crappy the world is, you can make a difference no matter how small it is. It's worth it. Despite all the differences in being targeted to kids, these shows have remained two of the most well-balanced anime shows that still hold up even decades later, and their stories are worth admiration. If you by some reason haven't seen them, I would encourage you to do so, as they are meant to be watched. There's just so much I didn't get to talk about or explain. Whether it's the choreography in Avatar, or even Batman's Count of Kagayosho inspired fight with the Clock King, to the spot on voice acting. Me describing it just doesn't do it justice. If you're more of a comics fan who likes noir stories with stoic heroes, you would like Batman a little bit more. If you're more into an emotional story with perfect build-up and well-choreographed fight scenes, you would probably prefer Avatar. And both certainly have left their mark as well as paved the way for many other great stories in Western animation. Batman the Animated Series started DC's Animated Universe, which revolutionized DC's animated adventures, Batman, and the superhero genre well before Marvel Cinematic Universe got started. It even pushed Disney into making their own show that could compete with it, which would be their black sheep cult classic Gargoyles. Avatar, while not being the first Western animated show to be influenced by anime, it was one to bring it into the mainstream. Without these two, we probably wouldn't have gotten other shows like The Clone Wars, Young Justice, and most other acclaimed animated shows as they really pioneered what could be in them. You could be gritty, you could be violent, you could talk about issues like poverty and sexism. And you can show these to kids, and they can accept it and understand it. For that, they are true timeless classics. And maybe in the next one I will compare and contrast their sequel series, Batman Beyond and Korra. But before that, what did I miss, and what do you wish I talked about more? Please leave a comment to let me know. This is my first video, and I would enjoy the feedback. I know I had some problems, especially with the sound, for cutting it up, and I do apologize for that. This is my first video, and I just kept getting feedback in some of the sound loop, and I don't know why or what was causing it, so I had to do a lot of takes and just edit it together, as the noise seemed to start at random for some reason. 
And if you made it all the way to the end, please like, subscribe, and thanks. Now, here's some crack. I learned there was another way to defeat him and restore balance. You lasered his balls off? Yep. But at least I didn't kill him. But you lasered his balls off! I mean, he had it coming, and I'm surprised he had him to begin with. Jesus. Hey, bro, can I get a sip of that water? It's not water. Yeah. Vodka. I like your style. It's vinegar. What? It's vinegar, puss. He's dead. Not the dickhead. What do you want me to say? Hey, how you doing? Well, I'm doing just fine. I lied. I'm dying inside. You're going to melt just like a grilled cheese sandwich. No, I made a promise. But I didn't see this coming. I didn't count on being happy. That's rough, buddy. Hey, baby. Want to take a gander at some Adam West penis? Oh my god, he just ran in.